Yeah. <laughs> All right, so for everyone online, we have a nice little group of people sitting here at uh, CSAIL in the STAR uh, room in the State of Building. Um, we're joined here today, my name's Una Mae O'Reilly, I'm Shash's thesis advisor, and we're joined here in person by two members of his committee, uh, Professor Evelina Fedorenko and Professor Armando Salarazama. And online, we have Professor Sujia Liu from Michigan State University. Um, so welcome to the committee. Um, I'm going to tell you about the format so that you know what to expect. Um, Shash is going to talk for about 40 minutes. Um, and then you and people online, I'm looking at the people here presently, everyone who has been invited or who has chose to come can ask some questions. Um, we're going to keep those questions to a, you know probably five or 10 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have you leave. Um, and then the committee will ask Shash some questions. And if you want, you can hang around because shortly after those questions or when those questions are over, Shash will be outside as well. Um, and then the committee will deliberate. We'll call Shash back in. We'll have our little thing and we'll go at it and we'll see what happens when we all emerge. Um, so that's what to expect. Um, and this is also a time for me to come up with something that's personally endearing about Shash. I scraped the barrel, I thought around. Actually, it wasn't very hard. He's been here uh, at MIT for six years and he's been such a positive and high contributing member to the Alpha Group. And I wanted to call that out. And uh, amongst all the different things that Shash has contributed to Alpha, uh, and I'll say more later uh, after this is all over, um, what I wanted to call out is that he makes mistakes so well. <laughs> Um, you know, we have to make mistakes when we go through this whole process. Um, and I just, uh, Shash is just like everyone else. He's made mistakes. Um, but it seems that he always can recover um, and tell a good story about it. And we all laugh about it later. And so that's something just to keep in mind when you, uh, when you go through this a journey similar to him, if that's what you're doing. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over and let Shash start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yunamir, for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone here. Welcome, everyone who's on Zoom. Uh, thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited to present uh, to all of you the work that I've done uh, during the course of my PhD over here. Uh, this simple schematic really conveys the essence of... Uh, let me just quickly check that things are unmuted. Okay, all right. Yeah, so this uh, simple schematic really conveys the essence uh, of what I study in my thesis and what the title of my thesis conveys. Uh, the central problem that I investigate is understanding programs. And I study the problem from two perspectives, a computational perspective and a cognitive neuroscience perspective. Uh, in the computation perspective, really, I'm interested in how machines can be trained to understand programs. Uh, and from the Cognito perspective, I'm interested in how we behave and respond when we understand programs. And in addition to this, I'm interested in how these two perspectives can really inform each other. So how can like what we learn about like computation, um, uh, how, how uh, machines learn, can that be used to inform like how uh, we think about programs and the other way around as well. So this is broadly the theme of uh, my thesis. And now let's just take a closer look at uh, each of these two perspectives and what my, I mean by uh, machines understanding them and like uh, our minds understanding them. So when I say I'm interested in um, uh, how machines can understand programs, what I really mean is how machine learning models can be uh, trained to reason about coding tasks. So I'll refer to such models that are trained on programs as code models. Uh, these models uh, on processing a program, uh, they come up with a representation of a program. So, uh, and I'm interested in this entire pipeline. So how these models can be designed, uh, how can the programs be fed into these models, uh, and finally, what information these uh, representations really encode. Uh, to understand what these model representations really mean, uh, let's just take a quick look at like the entire like, training pipeline of how these models are trained, and that'll give us like an idea a more concrete idea of what I'm talking about. So code models uh, first require programs to be processed. Uh, so these programs can be represented in like multiple ways. 
Uh, you could either multiple, uh, you could represent them as like a string of tokens. Uh, you could have like a tree representation and a graph representation. The whole idea is, I hear some feedback, so I'm not sure if someone's unmuted, please do mute yourself. Yeah, so um, what code models really do is they take in this input and really convert them into like a bunch of numbers uh, and that forms the input representation. So this vector, of, yeah, if someone can. Yeah, thank you. I mean, things seem to have cleared out. So uh, they first require uh, programs to be, uh, sorry, the program, the representations, the idea is to first uh, convert it into like a bunch of numbers and there are like multiple ways to go about it. And then these models take in these numbers, which really represent what the program is doing. And uh, you learn the parameters of these models and think of the model as like a big matrix, which transforms an input to an output and comes up with uh, the model's understanding of what is happening in the program. So this model representation uh, usually is optimized to uh, perform some task. Uh, this could be like an unsupervised task, a supervised task, uh, the choice that really uh, depends on how the model is designed. Uh, but it is this model representation that I talk about. So what the program, uh, what the model understands after having processed a program, after having analyzed a program, it's encoded in these numbers. And the real question is like, what does it encode? What do these numbers really mean? Does it really capture and encode all the stuff that is present in the program and what the program is trying to convey? So code models uh, have grown in popularity over the last like six or seven years, uh, I would say. Uh, I think uh, it's all started off with uh, auto-completion uh, models and summarization models. So essentially these models uh, try to predict what the next set of uh, tokens are, just like when you type on like a Google query, it tries to complete for you. Uh, and since then, I think every IDE a programming environment has now been integrated uh, with these models. And a summarization model is similar where uh, uh, a program is summarized into like a string of text or nine or two lines, which, uh, as, like, which conveys the meaning of what the program is really up to. And since then, there are like a bunch of other applications that have come up, improving variable names, uh, grading uh, programs and like uh, providing feedback to students, uh, vulnerability detection, predicting types. All these have seen some, uh, all these applications have benefited from code models uh, having been released. Okay, so, uh, switching over on the cognitive neuroscience side, uh, I study how we humans pro process programs in our minds and in our brains. And I use those two words deliberately, uh, minds and brains. By brains, I refer to, let's say the physical regions, uh, which are responsible in understanding programs. And by minds, I refer to uh, our thoughts and our perceptions uh, that we experience when understanding programs. And uh, both of these, our brains and minds can independ uh, they're, they're worth studying independently and they can tell us a lot about like how we uh, understand programs. Uh, just like how we saw machine learning models coming up with these representations, uh, we can study representations which our minds and our brains uh, form as well. So for instance, uh, just measuring how like the reaction times of someone after having seen a program or done like a particular programming task is one way to represent what is happening in our minds when they read this program. Uh, likewise, it could also be gaze information, just recording where someone is looking at and like what they're attending to gives us an insight as to what is really happening uh, in their minds. And more explicitly, if you want to look at what's happening in our brains directly, uh, we could also probe uh, the neural activity that is happening in different regions of the brains uh, through uh, techniques like fMRI and EEG and ECG. And that gives us a, rep a neural representation of what is happening in our brains when we understand programs. So this is, uh, these are the kinds of representations that we consider, that I consider uh, when we look at like uh, how our minds and brains uh, understand programs. And uh, one other aspect is really to bridge these two representations that I talk about. And I ask whether uh, our knowledge of, let's say, how our minds and brains uh, understand programs, can that really inform how, let's say, computational models or code models uh, representations are built? And likewise, uh, can the information present in code models, can that inform how um, we think and how can that help discover how we uh, understand and analyze programs. 
So what's on today's menu? Uh, I shall talk about work I've done under each of these three verticals. Uh, in the interest of time, I shall stick to uh, two works each uh, for each of these verticals. And uh, these questions will give you a flavor uh, for the kinds of challenges each vertical poses. And note here that uh, you don't have to read through the questions. I'll, I'll go through them one, one by one uh, in some time. Uh, the, the bridge questions aren't necessarily questions which bridge the two corresponding computational and cognitive neuroscience questions, but rather they give you a sense for the kinds of questions uh, that can be asked at the intersection of these two verticals. All right, let's get uh, into the computation perspective first. Um, so the first question really that I uh, explored was, uh, what is the test of a code model's basic understanding of a program? And uh, consider the scenario, if you're given a model, someone has already trained this model. And uh, the question then is like, in the trained model, how do we know that the model has really understood uh, programming concepts? And what is like a basic test for it? Uh, and for this discussion, let us consider a simple code summarization model because that truly, I mean, tries to mimic uh, what, what uh, we humans go through when we understand programs. So in some sense, the model is trying to understand a large chunk of code and try to come up with like one sentence or a couple of sentences to describe what is happening. The key idea for the test I devised uh, comes from this simple observation. So humans, uh, we have this tendency where uh, given any program and given any small modification made to the program, uh, it doesn't really affect our understanding. So consider like some variable name being changed from like, let's say list to ABC, that re really doesn't un like affect our understanding of what the program is really doing. Of course, if you go ahead and change all the variable names, perhaps it impedes our understanding, but with few modifications and few transformations of these sorts, uh, it doesn't really affect our understanding. And the question is like, can more code models be put to the same test? Uh, can, are these models robust to these kinds of small changes, uh, such as like changing a variable name? Now, uh, how do I operationalize this idea? So the situation is we are given a code model, the weights are frozen, and we are given an input program, which we want to test. Uh, the, the, there are like a couple of design choices over here. So suppose the first thing to consider really is where do I make that modification? Suppose I want to make this modification and test a program. Where do I make that modification? There are like a bunch of choices and consider for the time being that we are looking at like variable names. Uh, it could be really any transformation. So variable names is one such transformation. Uh, and if you stick to variable names, there's like a whole choice of which variable names to tweak. And if we select, let's say one particular variable name, the next question to really consider is like what to modify it to. So after having picked list, I have a choice of renaming it to anything uh, in order to test whether the code model is robust to um, the, the change that I make. And there too, I have a choice. And uh, the way I solve this problem is to cast it as like a combinatorial optimization problem uh, where we go ahead and actually solve for the least number of changes that need to be made to a program such that the, the, the model completely misunderstands what the program is doing. So uh, as a result, what we found was we tested a then state-of-the-art code summarizer model, which completely misunderstood 30% of the programs in our data set uh, with just one variable name, which was changed. So this speaks to probably the model not being robust to these kinds of small changes. And the hope is that uh, yeah, models that are trained to perform well on code tasks, on code uh, reasoning tasks, should be resilient to these kinds of changes. Uh, the code contribution over here was in a sense an optimizable code modifier. So the kinds of modifications and the transformations that you saw, uh, that really is the contribution over here. And uh, one thing to note is this modifier is really independent of the model itself, the model's architecture, the kinds of transformations that you can make uh, and is like a general setup, which we'll also revisit uh, in, in one of the bridge applications that I'll speak about. Moving on, uh, the next question that I tackled was, uh, can code models learn concurrent programs? Uh, we would have all dealt with concurrent programs in some shape or form. So think about whenever you last booked a airline ticket or a movie ticket, it's essentially you're dealing with a concurrent program wherein there is one program, there are like few uh, like limited commodities like the seats in an airplane or the seats in a movie theater. And there are multiple people trying to access these common commodities. 
Uh, so what these what a program typically looks like, a concurrent program, is no different from like any other sequential program. So just by looking at the source code itself, it's really hard to, to, to understand the nuances involved. And what really uh, makes uh, what really describes these concurrent programs is the execution trace itself. So the, by the execution trace, I mean really like running the program and like recording what is actually happening as each line of the code is uh, processed. Now you can imagine just by looking at the source code, it's really hard to say what's happening. And the, the behavior of the program comes to light when multiple users try to interact with it. And uh, depending on like a number of factors, how the CPU schedules things, uh, of the user one could be allowed to, let's say run the first two lines of the code, then paused out, swapped out, user two can then come in, run, run a few more lines of the same code and so on. And usually what happens in these kinds of situations and concurrent programs are a nightmare even to this day for most software engineers is the fact that if you don't handle your cases properly, uh, you can either overbook or like underbook your resources. So this, this typically happens when multiple people try to access the same resource at the same time. And uh, that's what we call uh, data races. So the question at this point uh, that I was asking was like, is it even feasible to train code models to learn this task of uh, detecting data races? Uh, and it's a good problem. I mean, like one way to, um, the, the, it's, it justifies to detect data races because in that way, we at least have uh, the, the code model then attempts to really understand concurrent programs if it is able to successfully detect these data races. But the question was, is it even feasible to ask this question? Is it okay to train these models? And the answer is yes, because data race detection is an NP hard problem. Uh, there really are like very few algorithms uh, which actually go ahead and do a good job at it. And most algorithms which are like practical, pragmatic, they're all heuristics at the end of the day. So they're like a bunch of rules written by some uh, designers and academics. And these are the kinds of tools that are used to detect races. And if heuristics can be written out, so can it, like you can learn the whole thing using data as well. So that was the whole motivation behind like actually going ahead and uh, learning, uh, attempting to learn a model. So what we, uh, going back to the overall pipeline, uh, what we see is uh, clearly the input, just reasoning about with the input is not sufficient. You actually need the execution log uh, to reason about. And then if I were to train this model to predict data races, what I really need is a set of annotated execution race, uh, traces. Because uh, if I have to train a model, I need some ground truth. And when we were going through this problem, the realization was that there's absolutely no annotated data sets for uh, concurrent uh, uh, like execution traces. And uh, this is justifiable because uh, uh, the, it's, it's a hard problem and I'll talk about it in a bit. And the idea then was to generate this larger data set as a first step in this entire chain. So yeah, as I was mentioning, uh, if I were to really gather a large data set of annotated traces, uh, there are a couple of ways to go about it. One is I source bugs from concurrent programs in production. Uh, this is a tricky business. Uh, testing concurrent programs is again, like a nightmare. Uh, even if you do manage to catch bugs during your testing, they're gonna be very few in number and it's not gonna be sufficient enough to probably train uh, a code model. Uh, the other way to go about this is to use established data race detectors that I spoke about. These are heuristics which have been created uh, to detect data races and create like a whole true positive data set from it. Now, the problem with this uh, was, to our surprise, what we found was the detectors that have been proposed over the last four decades, uh, they've all been benchmarked strangely against each other instead of like a common ground truth uh, benchmark uh, data set. So in a sense, we are not even sure whether these data race detectors themselves do a good job at uh, detecting races. And uh, this was uh, our realization when we said, okay, we need to do something different. And what we ended up doing, and I'll talk very briefly about this, is we created this data set ourselves by injecting races uh, into execution traces of uh, concurrent programs. So we take a execution trace of an actual concurrent program, we inject a race into it, we use an SMT solver, which is a technique uh, which is commonly used in program analysis. We use an SMT solver to then shift these injected races apart. 
so that the new trace that gets generated becomes a part of our, it becomes a sample in the data set. And we run this process many, many times. And as a result, we end up like um, gathering like a big data set. Surprisingly, what we have seen is the generated data set because it really doesn't have, it doesn't depend on any algorithm as such uh, or like any other heuristics. It uh, ends up uh, finding examples or generating examples which completely uh, the, the uh, let's say data race detecting algorithms that have been proposed over the last four decades, they completely fail to detect these counter examples that have been generated. Uh, so the core contribution in this work was it was it is a first step at modeling concurrent programs and databases. Switching tracks, I'll now speak about uh, the Cognero perspective and the two questions that I address in this perspective. Uh, the first one was which parts of our brains are involved in code comprehension? Uh, this question stemmed from like a fairly simple observation. Uh, there seem to be certain classes of tasks which uh, we humans seem to be extremely good at. So for instance, describing what, what is present in this scene, uh, identifying a speaker in a crowded room, uh, analyzing the sentiment of a given piece of text. We seem to have like a natural ability to be able to do these tasks quickly and accurately. Whereas like training a machine to be able to do these tasks has been anecdotally, it's just been like a hard thing to do. And uh, there are many reasons, for, possible reasons for why this might be the case. And one reason is probably because we've got like dedicated machinery in our brains to help us do these tasks. So there's a vision system which takes care of, care of vision. There's this audio system which takes care of audio and there's like a language system which takes care of languages as a consequence of which we may be finding uh, it easy to do these tasks. And it's natural to ask like, okay, what about programs then? Our programs, uh, how, what is really happening in our minds and what, what is really happening in our brains when we comprehend programs? Uh, because Programs, like many other things, like let's say math and like music, they share a lot of common properties with language. So it could very well be a language or uh, be uh, the language system could be involved in understanding programs or given that it's like mathy set of operations, it could be some other set of uh, brain regions involved in this uh, understanding uh, what's happening in programs. So in order to test this, we look at two brain systems. Uh, one is the first one was the language system. The language system roughly appears on the left side of most humans. Uh, and what's uh, nice about this brain system is it responds strongly uh, to language stimuli. And this has been shown across different modalities, whether you're like looking at like written uh, language, uh, whether you read it, sign language, this, lang this part of our brain seems to light up and respond to those kinds of stimuli. And uh, we also look at this other brain system called the multiple demand system. And unlike language, this is fairly domain agnostic uh, and seems to respond to stimuli which involve general problem solving, working memory, logic, and math. So the way we set the experiment up was we uh, got people in an fMRI machine and showed them these kinds of stimuli. So let's say one group saw uh, programs written in Python, another group saw the same program, but described in English uh, so that we could control for like the common set of computations that are happening in our brains. And uh, we tried this out in two different languages. One is Python, one is Scratch Junior. And the reason for choosing Scratch Junior is it's completely devoid of uh, any language. It's got just visual elements in it. And that nicely controls for like language uh, or the presence of language. And uh, what we ended up seeing was the language system does not consistently uh, respond to code comprehension or is not involved in code comprehension whereas the multiple demand system is. So the contribution from this work was, we came up with like an experiment design to separate out responses from language sensitive brain regions and like other brain regions. And what we found out was the language sensitive brain regions are really uh, not consistently used uh, in code comprehension. Moving on, uh, a follow-up question that we asked was, uh, are program concepts encoded in the brain? So like I just described, there are these two brain systems that we found and we found uh, uh, each of them to be uh, res responding to uh, uh, code comprehension, but multiple demand system much more uh, so than the language system. What we had done in the previous study was we had looked at a difference between groups of individuals. And in this study, what we ended up doing was we went into each individual and then tried to see whether program, whether program information, information about programs 
can be decoded from the brains of these uh, individuals. And uh, the, the idea was like, it could so happen that let's say some programming concepts like loops and branching, uh, these are encoded in the multiple demand system and some other concepts like let's say string related operations or syntax or like syntax tree related operations are encoded in the language system. This is a hypothesis or at least the hypothesis that we started off with and we suspected this could be happening. One nice thing about like framing the problem this way is it also helps study the multiple demand system. Uh, the MD system has anecdotally been uh, said to be involved in and responsive to general problem solving. But uh, what constitutes general problem solving is really unresolved. Uh, so what we claim really is the way to study general problem solving is through programs. Uh, so we suggest in this work that uh, if we are successful in finding these program concepts in the multiple demand system, then very likely uh, we, we are describing what the multiple demand system is really uh, responsive to. And the idea is that the basis for, uh, let's say to describe general problem solving can be done using uh, programs. And we are not the first to think about this. I mean, it goes all the way back to like Alan Newell and Herbert Simon in their 1956 work uh, where they said, yeah, probably general problem solving can be framed as a task uh, in like uh, logic and uh, by describing it as programs. So that was the motivation. And unfortunately, we didn't really find these concepts to be uh, nicely distributed across the two brain systems the way we thought. Instead, what we found was both the multiple demand system and the language system were, uh, yeah, they, they, we were able to decode these programming concepts equally from both these uh, brain systems. There were some things where the multiple demand system we could do better, but we didn't see the broad sort of differentiation uh, that we thought might exist. So the core contribution over here was essentially decoding program concepts from the brain, different brain systems. And in a sense, these are probably the first steps at specifying the nature of stimuli that the multiple demand system responds to. Moving on, bridging the two perspectives, uh, I shall talk about two different applications which give you like a sense of how these two different representations can be, can inform each other. So uh, the first of these two questions is uh, the this uh, notion of like importance. I, I try to understand what is important to programmers when reading code. Now, empirical studies in like the eighties came up with this hypothesis that programs contain beacons. Now, uh, Susan Weidenberg, uh, a CS researcher, tried out this uh, nice little experiment where they are given a program, she showed it first to non-experts, asked them to read the program, memorize it, and asked them to recollect what the program was. And then she showed the same program to experts, asked them to do the same thing. And then uh, what she saw was there was a difference in the kinds of information that each of these two groups were able to recall. Uh, what she noticed was experts were able to somehow figure out like what is really important uh, in uh, understanding what the program does and would memorize those lines first before memorizing something else. And as a result would like go ahead and reproduce those important lines much more than like the non-experts who would have no idea what to attend to. And as a result, just randomly reproduce uh, these lines from memory. So she defined beacons as all those lines for which the rate of recall between experts and non-experts was the most. The question that I ask is, uh, can we automate the discovery of these beacons? And can beacons really help us understand more about code comprehension? Uh, my suspicion is probably yes, it can, because we think of this uh, scenario where there seems to be, there could be like a natural limit on the number of beacons that we can consume at any given point. So if there's like 10 lines of code and if there are like 20 beacons in it, probably that just makes it incomprehensible as to what's going on. So this was the question uh, I wanted to ask. And the way I approach this is by using uh, code models as a proxy for experts. Uh, the way I set this experiment up is by actually running a behavioral study uh, myself, where we asked uh, a bunch of experts to go through programs and really mark out what they found important. So the three experts could come back and like say, these are the three different uh, snippets of the program that they find important. 
And really the task is, can a code model go ahead and actually predict the, the presence of these um, uh, important tokens, which the experts mark out. Uh, and we just have, we, these are initial results. Uh, what we see is the human experts themselves agree between, them, uh, between each other with a correlation of around 0.5 as to the presence of these beacons. So in, unfortunately in Weidenberg's study, uh, there were like probably just like two experts who were used in the study and like two programs. And across like 10 experts, we find that yes, there is seems to be some consensus as to what is like an important snippet in a program. And model representations seem to be doing a much better, better job than human experts themselves at like correlating and predicting what these um, beacons are. So, Oh yeah, yeah. So the the model essentially uh, the the input to the model is each token. The model then produces a representation for each of those tokens, and I'm trying trying to predict the tokens to the, the representation for each token with the output for each token. So each token has an annotation from every uh, expert as to whether it is important or not, and I'm using these model representations to predict that one or zero label. But I guess the question is: so during training you're predicting on the annotations of the humans? That's, uh, so the, the, the model is already pre-trained. I'm using pre-trained okay. models. I'm not training anything in this process. This is just like uh, using an off-the-shelf language model and then seeing whether this language model, the representations contained by the language model is informative enough to be able to predict the presence of uh, these, these beacons. Okay. Uh, and uh, the last part is, uh, the question that I ask is, can we generate programs optimized for cognitive behavior? So let's consider hypothetical. Uh, we actually, again, it seems to be, uh, the, the, let's say we do actually have a model which can predict these beacons, or let's say we have a model which can predict the mental load when you read a program. Uh, given these models, uh, can we now generate programs which actually control for the number of beacons or control for the mental load? Can I minimize the number of beacons in like any synthesized or generated program? And the answer is yes. Uh, and it's the same framework that I described in uh, uh, my first question, which can actually be used to go ahead and achieve uh, this as well. Uh, and in fact, while I don't study this directly with programs, uh, this is work uh, that I did with uh, Greta Takute over at uh, the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department where I show that using this method, we can actually generate sentences which can completely control the activity that's happening in the language system of the brain. So in some sense, we are able to now control for like generated sentences and programs uh, which go ahead and optimize for certain cognitive behaviors. So uh, wrapping up, uh, the big picture contribution on the, from the computation perspective that I spoke about, uh, I, I spoke about some methods to test and improve uh, code understanding in code models. Uh, I also spoke about like how we've taken the first steps towards uh, code models to understand like concurrent program behavior. Uh, on the cognitive neuroscience side, uh, we now have like a better understanding of where code comprehension happens in the brain. Uh, we also better understand what code properties are encoded in the brain. And uh, also we have probably the first steps at uh, specifying the nature of stimuli that the multiple demand system uh, responds to. And uh, the bridge perspective, we have uh, the, from the perspective of the computational perspective, informing the cognitive science perspective, I talked to you about like uh, using code models to be better understand uh, behavioral responses, such as finding uh, important uh, tokens and finding beacons. And in the other direction, I showed how models of cognitive behavior can uh, help control and help generate uh, programs and synthesize programs. So where to from here? Uh, it's a long laundry list. Uh, so from the computation perspective, I think uh, probing code models for the concepts they acquire is like a big open task. And uh, it's only recently that these works have picked up momentum. Uh, integrating the role of the MD system is not really clear. Um, so we spoke about how the MD system is, uh, seems to be extremely uh, responsive to code comprehension but uh, there's nothing from the uh, there's nothing that we do currently that actually models the md systems behavior when we train these code models 
uh, other behavioral, uh, so from the cognitive science perspective, there are simply, I think like a bunch of behavioral responses to core understanding that, we, that are waiting to be explored. Uh, for instance, we don't even understand simple things like uh, whether uh, programming, uh, like how we pick up programming is correlated to, let's say our ability in language or math or like other skills. Um, and we don't even understand things like the role of expertise. So what does expertise, really, how does that change the uh, um, beha like behavioral understanding of like how we process these programs? And can we like train models and can we come up with models to explain these behaviors? And uh, all the work that I spoke of uh, uh, just pertains to like reading and understanding code. Uh, again, what happens when we write code? What happens when we debug code? All these I think are open questions. Uh, there's also, again, like uh, dealing with different programming environments. So there are visual programming environments. There are like data manipulating uh, programming environments like R and Python. All these seem to yeah, require uh, something different, but uh, we just don't really have like a good handle on like what these different things are. Uh, so that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, I sincerely thank all my collaborators who have directly or indirectly sort of uh, supported uh, the work that I've done and presented in this thesis. And a special shout out to the three who are right on top, uh, Jingan, Ben, and uh, Michael for leading some of the work that I described today. Uh, someone had to pay for me while I did all this fun stuff. Uh, so thank you, a sincere thank you to MIT, IBM, Watson AI Lab, um, uh, to David and Ode for like uh, a generous grant which funded most of my work. And also thank you to CCL and Sonotype for funding uh, some parts of it. And of course, thanks to all my thesis uh, committee members and especially like Evan Sigia, whom I have collaborated with over the last couple of years now and who have been extremely gracious and warm in accepting me as a collaborator. Uh, thanks to my fun group, uh, Fun Times. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, this was something that I was mentioning to, oh, sorry, this was something I was mentioning to uh, folks over here uh, just before I started. Uh, one of them, Jamal, had even sent me uh, audio clips of uh, singing Eye of the Tiger for the last two days, saying, yes, I can do this. So that's the kind of group uh, I had the privilege of being a part of. So thank you sincerely. And also a shout out to Eric, Abdullah, Jamal, the first three uh, when I joined. I mean, this, these are the old crew. Uh, it, uh, it's not easy for an outsider like me to get into a system like MIT. Uh, so uh, I, gen I genuinely thank uh, Varun and Aspiring Minds. So this was a group that I was a part of and I spent like a good six years before joining grad school. And uh, I sincerely thank all my letter writers as well uh, who wanted the very best out of me. Uh, thank you to my family. Uh, I am who I am because of all of them, my aunts, my everyone really. And uh, thank you to all the wonderful friends I've made uh, along in this journey, so most of whom uh, are here today. And uh, a special thanks to Yuname for uh, uh, taking a chance on me. So what I knew about Yuname uh, was she had dabbled in this, this intersection of programming languages and like machine learning way back. I think like she has papers from like 2000s where she was using machine learning to uh, optimize compilers and compiler heuristics. Uh, but what I didn't know about her was her interest in uh, neuroscience as well. So this is like a clip from MIT News from 2003, where she was involved in creating like a humanoid personal assistant. And that explained all the books in neuroscience and vision that I saw in her office in the first week that I got here. So in some sense, uh, I hit the jackpot and finding an advisor who had like all the right interests that I had. Uh, so thank you, thank you for everything. And uh, with a heavy heart, uh, uh, I probably uh, have to conclude over here. Uh, so yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll probably miss all of this. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question online to start. Okay. Yeah, sure. um, 
It's from Varun Agarwal, mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to read it. Sure. Um, and it probably had some context as you were talking, but uh, hopefully you can find the context sure. or he can uh, step in and, and say some more. He asks, do you think that your work can be a stepping stone for defining a theory of how we learn programming, similar to Chomsky kind of work for language learning? Probably experimental work would be connected to postulated detailed theoretical models. Yes, these are the kinds of questions that start like flame wars and like actual like the near wars. So uh, Chomsky, I think, is a touchy topic. Uh, I'll steer clear of it. Uh, the way I will answer this question is yes, probably. In fact, uh, defining a theory, probably, at least it gives us. Um, so unlike, unlike these other theories, which are not like data backed, I think we are going the other direction where we are first trying to establish what data that we can see, what empirical information that we can find about like how we behave and how we interact with programs. And if a theory comes off of it, nothing like it. Uh, are we there yet? I don't think so. Uh, is there more to be understood? I think, yeah. So it'll, it'll be a while until a nice theory can probably be distilled out of all of this. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, the, I, I believe these are like the right first steps to be taking, at least in empirically establishing uh, what, what actually happens in our brains. Okay, I'm gonna turn to the audience here. Have we got a question here? Please. Uh, so Thanks, Josh, for a great uh, defense. Um, so in your Code Beacon program, mm -hmm. so what do the experts um, pick up on? And did you do a control comparison between like the structure and the meaning of the program? So, uh, okay, now what they do seem to pick up on is, I'm not sure because there seems to be, so the question that we asked them to do was just like, find or like mark out what you think is important to your understanding of the program and nothing more specific than that. And they all seem to at least like come to like us. They, they, okay. What I managed to observe was they don't really care about like these overall structures, like the presence of loops and like conditions and so on. So that is not getting marked. It only seems to be certain data and control dependencies that get marked. So that seems to be the driver for like what is informative and it's closely tied to uh, like what the objective of the function is. Uh, as to your like question on like, was there like a control for structure you said? Yeah, because now you're saying that loops do like they don't get picked up on, but if uh -huh. you had a loop rewritten in some other way or something. Like, you know, right, 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 no. so. It could be. So as a first step, what we started off with was just like showing people a random set of programs from like an actual software repository. Uh, and uh, that's probably like a good next step for us to actually segregate and like control the stimuli much more tightly. But for now, we just like went random and said, okay, let's first see whether there exists even a consensus to begin with because I was not really too sure after having looked at Weidenbeck's paper, it's just like, I think Weidenbeck was the sole person deciding what beacons were in that uh, entire study. So it seemed a little too good to be true. Uh, so I think the first question was, okay, let's just see what happens on like a random corpus of programs. Thanks. I think there's a follow-up question to that. So let me uh, go online to find a follow-up question to that, <laughs> which is from, uh, Mike S. What does it mean for a line of code to be important? Surely every line is important. Perhaps unimportant lines of codes are those that could be inferred from important lines. Presumably one needs to understand what the program does. No, I agree. I mean, uh, pedantically, I think every line is important, uh, but there seem to be at least like in the random corpus that we actually looked and the way in which people behave and people respond, there seems to be some prioritization of like certain lines over certain lines. Uh, we didn't, re unfortunately, yeah, there, there were no questions in that data set where like everyone came back and said, you know what, all the lines are important or all the tokens are important. There always seemed to be like some prioritization saying, yeah, if, if given a choice between like marking X versus Y is important, I think I'll go with X. 
So that seems to be uh, the way in which we are responding behaviorally. I don't really know what uh, uh, that that could really pertain to, and I think that's what this this whole style of work uh, does. Right, is if you look back at literature from the 80s and 90s, you'll find these elaborate definitions for what is important, and then almost no empirical evidence to support like what those definitions are. Uh, but rather, we are going the other direction, saying, okay, this is what exists empirically, uh, and now let's try to understand like why this exists. And uh, if code models can help discover what the predictors are, nothing like it. Uh, but yeah, if there's something else which can predict uh, what these important uh, tokens are, that's news. Uh, that's news in itself. So yeah, I, I wish I knew an answer to like what is this important thing. But it seemed that even and and another origin story for this this entire study itself was like just talking to developers and going through code review uh, cycles. And most of them reported that, yeah, we just go through this piece of code and we know really what to look at. And if those few lines are like, all right, yeah, we usually okay it. And what those few lines are, it seems to be extremely context dependent, what the function is and so on. And then the, the question was, okay, is this like a behavior that seems to come up over and again across like different uh, contexts? And seems to be, at least there is any initial evidence for it. Okay, any more? Yes, we've got one here. Yeah, thank you so much, Josh. I have a couple of high-level questions, I guess, piggybacking on this previous debate. So uh, you put up those uh, few papers, right? right? Looking at how people understand mm -hmm. code, maybe mm -hmm. learn the code from the 80s. Yep. And I had the same uh, realization in the literature review back in the day for our project that all of that work was done in the 70s and 80s and then kind of nothing since or almost yeah, no, nothing. No. And so that leaves the neuroscience part in an awkward place because usually we have this rich body of psychological behavioral work and then we can go and look at it in the brain. Yep. But now the behavioral stuff is kind of lacking. Why do you think that is? Is it coming back now? Where is that field at currently? I hope it is coming back now. I mean, that's what I can sincerely wish for. Because uh, it's strange. No, I've, I've seen this as well. I really have no explanation for it. It's so surprising that this hasn't been picked up. I think in the context of programs, probably it's a too niche a field. So understandably, people are not looking at it or haven't looked at it over the last 20 years. Uh, there are, that said, there are groups. So if you look at papers in like conferences like CHI, they do come up like once in a while, they come up, these, these kinds of behavioral studies do come up. Uh, but yeah, it's extremely sparse uh, and it's it's unfortunate is, is all I can say. Uh, but I think after like all the GPT-3 madness and all the other language model madness has happened over the last couple of years, uh, there's definitely a like a more conscious emphasis towards like really understanding what is happening and then tying it to human behavior. So they, at least in the programming languages domain, I can think of like two conferences or two like sub fields, which are like getting more attention and people, they seem to be at least like a group of people involved in each of these uh, uh, two, two, two sub um, conferences. Uh, but yeah, it, the trend seems to be improving. Hopefully it improves like to something much better than what it is today. And hopefully, yeah, we have more answers to insights and like behaviors like these. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, one more question, uh, also high level. I'm thinking about the models that you've used to derive code embeddings from yeah. and what kind of models might we uh, want to use? Yeah, as you said, for using the programs in a useful way, but also for predicting what humans might be doing with them. And looking at the similar question in language, right? Driving language embeddings, word embeddings, uh, text embeddings. Uh, it seems kind of similar, right? We imagine that humans can do all kinds of things with language and then, you know, that will also be reflective of human behavior, brain responses, et cetera. Yep. But then for programs, that's not necessarily the case, right? If we, we want embedding that's useful for program execution, maybe that goes beyond what a human might be able to do. Do you think there is a useful distinction there? It, uh, so I, uh, I think the, 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 spots in which the differences are most stark are 
the ones where the tasks are extremely programmed like than like uh, the the what is seen typically in like natural language so for instance a task like summarization would probably be the same uh, or like it would be reasonable to use like code models which are in the same style as in natural language but for tasks like let's say even like concurrency or like anything which is reasoning about specific data dependencies or like any kinds of like program analysis properties may or may not be i'm i'm not sure and that's again like a big open question as to like yeah how good are these code models because currently what has happened is all the code models that we have today are essentially like copy paste architectures from like an uh, nlp and there's absolutely nothing no customization whatsoever besides probably just changing the tokenizer and changing these little things there's really no nothing that has been customized for the sake of programs and it seems to work for the use cases that we care about which is code completion and like these other like summarization kind of tasks but i think if we start getting into like more nuanced tasks which let's say the program analysis community cares about uh it will likely suffer and we see this uh, even in some of the tasks that we have seen before the difference in the results is like huge so even code summarization uh at least this is 2 3 years back the state of the art code summarizers on like all these data sets were uh, i think 20 or 30 f1 score points below what nlp was achieving so it is a harder problem uh but at least for certain kinds of tasks it seems to like work out all right but i i think there's this whole class of tasks that we still haven't really thought carefully about as to what's the best way to model them Uh, first thanks for the presentation and uh i had a question about um uh, you presented uh that when reasoning about programming there's like these two uh, part of the brain that are responding when mm -hmm. reasoning about code mm -hmm. and you showed like first like a python like code and not then a visual thing um my question was uh do you have any so uh resources on uh how the two part of the brain respond depending on how high or low level the language is for example do the brain respond differently if it's like assembly or python this kind of questions no unfortunately not so what we do know at least from this study i can tell you things that we actually tested and then i can it, it is all like uh, hypothesis so what we saw from this study strangely was like variable names didn't have an effect so you would think that variable names would actually have an effect but that didn't seem to have an effect in in terms of like uh there being like a distinct difference in in like uh, activity between the two brain systems but that said if you want to look at like different programming languages itself my hunch is the the trend should like hold because scratch junior and python were like fairly different in the way they look and operate and the semantics uh but yeah uh, probably assembly may end up looking totally differently unsure because yeah reading assembly is like definitely much more like painful than like reading any of these other programming languages so who knows something else might be happening but yeah the, at least what we saw was across these two languages that's why we didn't really conclude strongly in in favor of like the language system because in python we saw much more activity than in scratch junior uh and the reason and because we saw this this uh, difference in like activity we were like okay let's best not to conclude that the language system is like active but the multiple demand system seem to be like fairly consistently active so i would imagine this would hold for like other languages as well but yeah, it's uh, your guess is as good as mine thanks questions in the chat are very philosophical <laughs> uh thanks josh this is a extremely comprehensive body of work and so what i wanted to ask is um so with your work on code models in general and kind of seeing you know how good are these things at comprehending the essence of programs um at you know are they robust to changes in variable names you know how do they do it you know predicting concurrency in programs and things like that um with the types of errors that like you you see there in the sense of like instabilities and lack of robustness do you think that um 
and this is kind of like a, a speculation question as you know, especially in the last you know year or two, code models are being increasingly inter integrated into software engineering workflows where they're really like, you know, out there interacting with APIs and things like that. Do you think that there needs to be somewhat of a like resurgence in an increase in all like kind of formal programming language methods, like reasoning about things like, you know, type safety and static analysis and like using building building better safeguards into systems since we're working with these models that are not only making errors, but are making errors in different ways than humans, which are, you know, current unit tests seem to be optimized for like, oh, let's consider cases where a human who thinks they know what they're, they're doing might make these types of errors, but their kind of intended semantics is correct. Versus in these cases, you might have completely different classes of errors. Um, what do you think are some of the important steps forward towards as code models become integrated into software engineering workflows, um, safeguarding against the, the different types of, uh, of problems that will arise there relative to just having, you know, a naive human programmer? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think this is the question that you asked is like every program synthesis person's nightmare as to like, okay, well, what kind of programs am I generating? Is this even right? So one direction which seems according and like in my opinion seems to be like an interesting and like the right direction is to be able to uh, integrate proofs as you were alluding to into this whole process so uh, as an example uh, i can i can get a model to uh, or train a model uh, to sort of co-emit a proof and a program at the same time and if it is able to do that successfully, because proofs are, you can like mechanistically check them, uh, they're at least better than test cases because there could be like a bunch of test cases you could completely miss out on. Uh, these, if, if you're able to train models which can also do your proving for you in some shape or form, then uh, we've hit the jackpot in the sense that we are at least closer to forming like much more secure. At least we can, we can have some we can rest, we can sleep well with the kinds of programs that we generate. Uh, but I think that is also like fundamentally, I wouldn't, yeah, that, that should be like a challenging problem because there's a big leap between going from proofs to be able to reason about like programs and all this is like data driven. So any logic person will just like scratch his head and say, okay, well, are you kidding me? You're learning proofs from data? Like well, what's what's happening? And uh, and I share that sentiment to some extent, but uh, yeah, all these inherent biases that I've had uh, have clearly been like proven wrong over the last like three years with the kinds of models and the kinds of tasks that they can do. So again, uh, this is wishful thinking. I hope I'm wrong in the long run, but uh, it's very unlikely. I mean, like if we have to come up with like realistic ways to generate these programs, which are actually well safeguarded and there are good guardrails, I would imagine these kinds of tools of the tools and like uh, synthesizing proofs along with like your, your program as a way of like guaranteeing uh, that your program is doing what it's supposed to do. But yeah, that's... All right, time is, is looming. So I'm going to call the um, public part of the thesis defense to an end. Okay. It's noon. I'd like to thank you all for coming. And let's thank Shash again. And so uh, he's going to answer some questions for the committee now. And you can see him later. Uh, so for all those of you who are on Zoom, I'll be logging off now. So thank you all for attending. Uh, I won't be logging back onto this account or like this, this particular Zoom room after the deliberation is done. So if you don't hear from me, you should assume things went well. If you hear from me, then probably something drastically went wrong. So thanks everyone. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye. I'm going to stop uh, the Zoom room now. Now you're going to get on a Zoom yeah. message here, right? Yeah.